These words are said by Richard to Mowbray. Uh, Richard will banish Mowbray from England for the rest of his life. And so Richard says to Mowbray, the hopeless word of never to return. Mowbray, you will never be able to come back to England. But as I thought about this line, I attached it to Richard himself. At some point, Richard comes to a point of no return. There's no way for him to save his kingship. There's no way for him to save his reign. There's no way for him to save his own self. Literally, in that he loses his life at the end of the play, but also morally, psychologically, spiritually. Near the end of the play, Richard himself will tell us this. He will reflect on the time that he wasted. And at some point, it was too late. At some point for Richard, the hopeless word went out, never to return. It's, this reminds me of a passage in Aristotle's Ethics where Aristotle talks about a, a person, a sick person who goes to the doctor. And the doctor says, well, do this and you'll be well. And the sick person hears what the doctor says and does not do what the doctor says. And Aristotle says of that sick person, there was a time when it was open to him not to be ill, if he had only listened to the doctor's advice, which reminds me of what we're going to see as we move on in Richard II. When John of Gaunt says of Richard II, he had counselors, but he would not listen to them. There was a time when it was open to Richard II not to have a disastrous end not to bring the disaster upon his own head. There was a time when it was possible for him to take a different course. But when had once thrown away his chance, it was gone. At some point, it's too late. And so Richard says these words to Mowbray, but I think in a sense, they apply to Richard himself. In Act 1, Scene 1, Richard says to Bolingbroke and Mowbray, Wrath, kindle, gentlemen, be ruled by me. Let's purge this collar. Let's purge this anger without letting blood. We don't have to have trial by combat. We don't have to have a fight to the death. Be ruled by me. But we saw that neither Bolingbroke nor Mowbray were open to that, which perhaps tells us a little something about their perception of the king. Well, we go to this trial by combat now, Bolingbroke and Mowbray face one another. And the Lord Marshal says, sound trumpets and set forward combatants. In other words, the fight's about to start. And Richard is there all the while, listening to what Mowbray has to say. He asks Mowbray, why are you here? Mowbray tells the king why he's here. And we'll see some of those quotes in a minute. Richard asks Bolingbroke, why are you here? And Bolingbroke says why he is there at this trial by combat. And so Richard is there, the trumpets sound, the fight is right about to start, and then at that very moment, Richard II indicates that the fight won't happen. And everything takes a sudden turn. Everything changes. Once again, we see Richard's nature. He seems resolute to do something, but then instantly it changes. And so the trial by combat does not go ahead. Richard says, let them, that is Mowbray and Bolingbroke, lay by their helmets and their spears and both return back to their chairs again. Draw near and list or listen what with our counsel we have done. For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered. So after all of this, Richard decides that we're not going to have this trial by combat. And so he says to Mowbray that his punishment will be life exile. The sly, slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return, breathe I against thee upon pain of life. So Mowbray is exiled for life. And then to Bolingbroke he says, we banish you our territories, you cousin Hereford, upon pain of life, till twice five summers have enriched our fields. So, 10 years. 
And then he sees Gaunt, Bolingbroke's father. And he says to Gaunt, Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes I see thy grieved heart. So he sees that Gaunt is saddened by this news that Bolingbroke will be banished for 10 years. And so Richard changes it then. He says, I have plucked four years away from Bolingbroke's exile. So now Bolingbroke is exiled just for six years, Richard says to him. Six frozen winters spent return with welcome home from banishment. So yet another example of Richard's unstable character. He seems decisive. Bolingbroke will be banished for 10 years, but then he suddenly changes it to six. And so a theme that is sort of continually with us from the beginning of the play is Richard's unstable character. We see that he changes Bolingbroke's years of banishment. He does this just after Mowbray warns Richard of Bolingbroke's intentions. Mowbray says, all too soon I fear the king shall rue the decision to allow Bolingbroke to come back. And then we see Richard before the trial by combat, his sudden change. And there are things that we see in Act 1, Scene 1 of Richard's instability, his changeability. And yet there's another case as Bolingbroke and Mowbray are saying what they're saying before the planned trial by combat. Bolingbroke says to Richard, Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand and bow my knee before his majesty. And then Richard responds, we will descend and fold him in our arms, which sounds very close. It sounds very familial. But then the language turns very formal again. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which if today thou shed, lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. In other words, Bolingbroke, if you are killed, I'll be sad for it, but I will not seek revenge. It's the sense of whiplash we get with Richard II. He says, I will fold him in our arms, which sounds very close, which sounds very personal. But then within just a few words, the language has become very formal. And well, if you're killed, I'll be sad, but I won't seek revenge. Yet more insight into this unstable character. I think we see in this scene that Richard fears the strength of Mowbray and Bolingbroke. Listen to what Mowbray says. My name is Thomas Mowbray, who hither come engaged by my oath, which God defend a knight should violate, both to defend my loyalty and truth to God, my king, and my succeeding issue. This language of certainty, this language of resolution, this language of strength that will not change. Very different from Richard. Then we have Bolingbroke, Harry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby, am I, he says, who ready here do stand in arms to prove by God's grace and my body's valor, enlists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he is a traitor, foul and dangerous to God of heaven, King Richard and me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. Again, this language of strength, this language of resolution, very unlike Richard. Richard will say to Mowbray, I espy, that is, I see virtue with valor couched in thine eye. Richard sees Mowbray's strength. He sees his resolution. And I think as a general rule, weak leaders, indecisive leaders. So in other words, people who aren't actually leaders, but they're in positions of leadership, they are weak, they're indecisive. I think they will often fear the strength of people who on paper are beneath them. But in terms of resolution, in terms of strength, in terms of commitment, are more powerful than they. People who have technical positions of leadership over stronger people, I think often must be threatened by that strength, threatened by that resolution. And so, very strangely, Richard requires Bolingbroke and Mowbray to take an oath that they will not join together. Obviously, he fears a threat. He fears that Mowbray and Bolingbroke will think about what they've been through. And they'll see that whatever differences they had between themselves, they have a common problem. 
in the king on the throne. These men of resolution, these men of conviction, these men of commitment, at least that's what it appears like at this moment, stand before this king of irresolution, this king of weakness, this king of indecisiveness. And if they really do care about England, then what should they do? Richard requires them to take an oath that they will not band together. Return again and take an oath. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to God, our part therein we banish with ourselves, to keep the oath that we administer. You never shall. So help you truth and God, embrace each other's love in banishment, nor never look upon each other's face, nor never write, regret, nor reconcile this lowering tempest of your homebred hate. The two of you must promise me that you will never meet, you will never speak, you will never write. What is Richard afraid of? He must be afraid of the resolution that they represent of the strength that they represent, of the commitment that they represent, for he lacks all of those things. And so we have the unstable leader. We have Mowbray on the left, who says, however God or fortune cast my lot, there lives or dies, true to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. This is how he speaks of himself, with not a sense of arrogance, but a sense of Truthfulness, I see myself as a loyal person, as a just person, as an upright gentleman. This was why I was willing to fight to the death to defend these things. Bolingbroke responds, or he says, As confident as is the falcon's flight against a bird, do I with Mowbray fight. Language of conviction, language of strength. And the indecisive, unstable leaders, they're listening to all of it. And it reminds me of a famous line from Aristotle, where Aristotle says that no tyrant needs to fear until men, people within the king's realm, begin to feel confident in each other. One of the things we often hear from people who live in dictatorships is that dictators promote mistrust. They promote mistrust mistrust within families, mistrust among citizens. Cruel dictators do not want the people to trust one another because if they trust one another, then they'll talk to one another. And if they talk to one another, then they'll discuss their discontents about the state. And perhaps those discussions of discontent about the state will lead to action. And so if I'm a cruel dictator, then I want to preside over a people that lives in fear that lives in a state of mistrust. They will not share their thoughts, even with the people closest to them, even among their closest family members, they will not feel confidence and trust. No tyrant need fear till men begin to feel confident in each other. What if Mowbray and Bolingbroke, for all of the intense disagreement they experienced, come to see that there's a problem even greater than that, the king himself. And then what should we do, they might say to each other. And so Richard says, the two of you shall never meet, the two of you shall never speak. Richard thinks he can solve this potential problem by banishing these men, by pulling this power play. But the fundamental problem is he himself. He is unstable. He is indecisive. He's the problem.